Hi, I'm Dr. Mindy Curry. I'm a naturopathic doctor. I do house calls in the greater Portland area, and I have a small home office in Milwaukee. And I'm here today to tell you all about Oregon Grape, this lovely bush that's standing all around me. This is a beautiful Oregon Grape, and this is also the state flower of Oregon. It's not blooming right now, but it would be a lovely little yellow cluster of flowers. Um, but this is the obviously the grape part of the Oregon grape. These lovely little powdery blue purple berries. That's your Oregon grape right there. Um, this is an evergreen. It stays beautifully green all, all winter long. Um, doesn't lose its leaves. It's, so it's quite a decorative plant as well as just being a wonderful plant that's been used medicinally and that's what I'm mostly here to talk about. I'm here to talk about the Oregon grape which can be used both the leaves, the stem bark, and the roots down there can all be used as medicine. It's a really great plant and these little grapes can be used as food if you're really really hungry and uh, desperate. Um, so basically organ grape. We're talking about the um, many species. There's probably 70 species and this is the Mahonia species and these are in Asia, Central and North America. Um, but we have basically six native species that are abund abundant in the Pacific Northwest and we're especially three very common species here are Mahonia aquifolium, this tall one that's back behind me. There's Mahonia repens, which is a creeping organ grape. It's a little bit more delicate and low sprawling one. And there's Mahonia nervosa, which is the dwarf organ grape we often find out in the forest uh, under big tall trees. Um, they're much smaller. <laughs> but uh, the, let's see, Native Americans in the Pacific Northwest used organ grape as medicine. Um, to treat illnesses such as arthritis, itchy eyes, syphilis, but a lot of things related to stomach upsets, such as loss of appetite, both for diarrhea and constipation. And they also use the yellow roots, the yellow, um, the bark of the roots has a very yellow pigment in it, and that can be used as a natural dye for baskets, wool, even to dye porcupine quills to make your jewelry extra beautiful. Um, it can be used, these funny little berries can be used as food in lean times, um, either dried, you can eat some of these raw, um, but often used more as a preserve or a jelly. Um, even today, some people take and make these little berries into a jelly or a wine, um, but it's mostly these days used in the florist industry or as greenery. Um, and landscaping or as a lovely garden plant. Uh, like I said, evergreen, yellow flowers, purple berries, a lot to love in the garden just to look at. But uh, another big use right now is as natural medicine. This has come back in its own and is used for a variety of ailments um, in, by modern traditional herbalists due to its strong antibiotic properties, antifungal properties, anti-inflammatory actions. This bush behind me is obviously very tall, so it is the Mahonia aquifolium. And you can see it has very holly-like leaves. Often you might mistake this for holly in the woods. It's quite different. Holly has got a much thicker leaf, uh, much stronger spikes. These are uh, more delicate spikes, more delicate leaves. Um, but in any case, the word aquifolium actually means it curves, the, 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 the spike curves like an eagle's beak. You can kind of see it there at the end. Um, let's see. These have, these berries here, these organ grape berries are exceptionally tart. Really not like a tasty food. Like I can do this. I can eat one. I don't really like it. That was a lot of vitamin C, but uh, not a really great flavor like it is. But it, like you said, it can be used to make foods, make it into a, a jelly. Um, it's a flavor that's quite difficult to love, but it is possible if you add enough sugar 
and uh, perhaps ferment it long enough to, to really like the end result. Now the parts that we would use in an organ grape, like I said, is the, the stems, the bark of the stems. If you get in there and you get that bark off, there is that yellow color is underneath there too. And that has a lot of our medicinal constituents. And more recently it's been um, discovered that the leaves actually have a lot of really good uh, medicinal compounds that actually um, added on make the yellow berberine content more powerful. Uh, the roots are also used. We'll, we'll show you those later. Um, there is a big movement to use organ grape instead of golden seal. Golden seal has been over harvested and overused for medicinal purposes and now people are saying back off that it needs to be allowed to come back and and to live its natural lifespan without being harassed by hairless monkeys but instead we will harass this so um, this is a lot more common a lot easier to find there are areas though where the florist industry has just gone in and in many cases illegally harvested just wiped out whole areas of the forest um, to use in, in arrangements and that's bad those areas need to be able to allow to be grown back too but uh, uh, generally this is considered less threatened than the very threatened golden seal so let's try to use more uh, more organ grape less golden seal when we're using that looking for that berberine content this bush behind me is holding the bank together for the creek right behind me in my backyard so I'm going to leave the roots of this alone um, but I, I will probably take I would be totally willing to harvest the leaves and stems off of the, these but for my purposes this time I've got some land out in southwest Washington and we're putting a path in or, or expanding a deer path and there are a variety of shall we call them volunteers who are some organ grapes that are growing over into the path so I'm going to take those out and use those for my medicine this time since they're uh, in my way <laughs> and I'm stronger um, so we will bring that medicine back into the kitchen We'll process that to make some medicines, probably a tea, a tincture, some wound salve. So stick along. Let's go out to the property and I'll see you again there. One more quick look though at this beautiful organ grape, Mahonia aquifolium. Look at it, very tall. That's got to be eight feet tall or something. Definitely taller than me very pokey beautiful beautiful little berries covered in this powdery dust which is actually its own bacterial coating or yeast coating I guess actually for any kind of fermenting processes it comes with its own yeast right there ooh Ooh, it's so beautiful. So red. The stems are red. You can see how the, the tips kind of point down. It's a lovely plant. Oh, hey, welcome to my land up in southwest Washington, overlooking the Cowlitz River. Here's the trail that we're going to be working along. And as you can see, it's got all sorts of things growing in it. Ferns, organ grape horse tails, oh, blackberries, just all sorts of stuff. But uh, actually, we're going to do a little bit of a pivot. Um, now that we're here, we've decided to skip the trail clearing for now and instead focus on installing a composter for our composting outhouse. The spot we've chosen just happens to be stuffed with all of these healthy organ grape. Lucky for this video. We're going to be clearing this land anyway, so I am going to take and collect all of these roots so nothing is wasted. And the organ grape that we remove, we will take home and we will make some excellent, excellent medicines with you. We're going to make a tincture, a tea, and a wound healing salve. And here we go. We are going to clear these out now.
So basically we're digging up all these organ grape roots and we're doing that in order to get to the, the yellow stuff in the bark. The bark has this yellow stuff called berberine and it's very bitter and it's an alkaloid. And there's several other plants that contain this alkaloid berberine including the organ grape, golden seal, barberry, yellow root. There's some in California, poppy, Chinese skullcap, and a variety of other herbs have some of this berberine in there. And it's just a beautiful, extremely medicinal phytonutrient. It has broad spectrum antimicrobial actions against bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoans, helmet, helmets. It's uh, helpful for chlamydia. It also is useful for relieving strep throat. It activates antipolitive pathways that is, are being looked at for preventing cancer. It can, it's been shown to lower triglycerides and cholesterol, improve immune system response to flus, especially in seniors that were studied. Um, it's been shown to protect the liver, improves insulin sensitivity in diabetes and metabolic syndrome. It can help reduce obesity by increasing brown fat. It's been studied for a variety of things. Um, more traditionally, it's used topically for skin infections and wound healing. It's used to treat leaky gut, dysbiosis, H. pylori, uh, stomach ulcer infections. Okay, and here we've done it. Look at it. We have harvested these big patch of organ grape root. Here they are. Here's the leaves, the organ grape leaves. And here it is. What we're looking for, the organ grape root. That is where all our yellow gold is located. It's, it's a beautiful plant. It's come from a beautiful set of woods. I think this is going to make really great medicine. And here's the really great composter we made there. And first thing you've got to do is wash off all that dirt. Hey everyone, we're back. I've uh, brought all those organ grapes I harvested up at uh, my recreational land and brought them back here to process for you. And what we're gonna do is we're going to scrape the bark of the root and the stem off of these ones. And well, these have gotten a little dingy because of the heat wave and taking a couple days to get to them. So we're gonna probably just toss out those uh, leaves and get a few more leaves off my bushes out in the back. They're quite plentiful and pokey, so some of them got to go. But uh, yeah, let's get started. So today the tools of our trade, we're going to start out with the old scrubby brush and we want to scrub down all the roots, get off all the, the dirt and other creepy things that might be on there. Um, we've got a potato peeler, a different kind of potato peeler, um, really nice kitchen scissors uh, sheer thing, and just a knife, bowl for the root shavings, and just another one to work with. One more thing here, I guess, uh, probably had to tell you is that you probably want to work on this root bark and bark, peeling that when it's still fairly fresh. When it gets really dry, it gets just really hard. It's really hard to take off of there. But when you get it when it's fresh, you can actually get those uh, bark off the root and stem fairly easily. Let's get back to it. Okay, while I'm working, let's talk about a few more things there are to consider when using organ grape. It's very astringent, it's cooling and drying, and so it should probably only be used in short term mostly. 
especially for people that tend to be dry or chilly kind of constitutions. Those kind of people, if they take it long term, they can end up having really sluggish digestion and really dry, flaky skin resulting, and that could be from the organ grape. So uh, more of a short-term thing. It's kind of a big hitter when you're having a problem, but then back off. It can also interfere with macrolide antibiotics, so don't combine it, especially in patients with cardiac problems. It can affect blood thinning, so use with caution with warfarin. High doses of isolated berberine extract can actually be rather drug-like, and there have been reports of dysbiosis as berberine, high doses of, of extracted berberine selectively impacts, especially the Veruca microbia, proteobacteria, and bacterioids phyla, which can be great in some circumstances, but if overdone, can lead, lead to other imbalances in gut flora. Now, interestingly, whole plant extracts don't tend to show this drug-like effect. Whole plants include the beneficial saponins that berberine extracts lack. Hey, now we've got a whole tray full of just these wonderful bright yellow bark stems. You can see it kind of peeking through the, the bright yellow bark. is right there under the surface. And that's the stuff we want, the berberine content there, the, the yellow bits. You gotta make sure that it's bright yellow when you harvest it. If it's just cream colored, you're not getting very good medicine out of that bark. And it's just kind of wasting a tree. So, or a shrubbery, I should say. Look at that. We want the yellow, bright yellow. And so there's a few ways to do that. Um, just the most basic way is to take a knife and um, just shave it off. You can do it in a more upright fashion, which is really effective. You can do it kind of from the angle. That kind of works. Whatever you feel proficient with. But basically, you're just getting all of this uh, really bright yellow bark off. Look at that. That's the good stuff. It's a good dye. It is a dye. It's to die for, or to live for, to help live. That's what we're going for, just the, uh, the shavings of these roots. And it does take a while, especially the curvy ones. But also the shavings of the stem bark. The stem bark, as long as it has the nice yellow content underneath it, that's also quite very effective. Some people prefer it because obviously you don't have to kill the whole plant. In my case, I don't usually like to kill the whole plants, but uh, I was removing the organ grape from that area for a different purpose. So it had to go, and so it's not going to go to waste. We don't want things to go to waste. If you do something that disturbs nature, make sure you're getting everything out of it while you're there. And I let it know what the purpose was. It's good to provide your intention. In this case was both to make a composting bin just far enough away from our camp where the animals and the smells won't get to us. While also harvesting a significant amount of organ grapefruit. Now you see you get down below the bark of the root 
and it starts to be kind of a lighter color. If you look right in the tip, it, it's lighter. You don't really need that lighter, lighter woody bits. Those are not as useful. Kind of pretty. If you like yellow sticks. <coughs> Now let's try something else you might have at home, just a basic potato peeler. You know, one of these guys. It's also a real good way to do it if you aren't clumsy with knives. Um, it's pretty efficient. You don't get quite the small shreds, but you can. You can just kind of go back and forth and really really get that good. It doesn't quite look as cool as like a, a big bulky out back knife with a antler handle. Something cool forged by hand in your own smith. But just this is I think like a KitchenAid. KitchenAid potato peeler might actually speed things up for you a bit. You might like that. You might be traditional, like the knife. But uh, I like to really get in there. I find this kind of is just more efficient. Look at that. This is a naked, naked stem. There is hardly any of that left. Compare that to my, my knife work. My knife work is not quite as good. And I have a tendency to slice myself, so potato peeler. Here's another kind of potato peeler. The extra fancy kind. It's got the shreds on one side and the potato peeler on the other. Let's see how this guy goes. He's also pretty nice. I'm going over a pretty rough one here. This guy's really getting it out. But I'd say it takes actually a little bit more effort than this one. The standard side one. Let me show you how fast I'm going since I've moved to the potato peeler. Either one. Great shreds, beautiful color. <clears throat> yeah. For all the hype, this thing has just not been quite as magical as I was hoping it would be. It's really great for zucchini and carrots to make really beautiful shreds. Use that guy. The other end, eh, nothing magical. I think it would sh definitely sharpen up to cut off my knuckles if I get too close to it, but uh, as far as hitting the roots, it gets a pretty thick thick peel, but that's not necessarily what I'm going for is a thick peel. I'd like one that's comfortable to do because I've got a big pile of roots. So I'm going to switch back, not to the knife, skip the fancy peeler, get the old fashioned, just regular old peeler. I'm going to peel away.
Okay, so we're back in my kitchen here. We've got our whole plate of lovely organ grape root and stem bark that's been peeled out. You can see this lovely, lovely yellow color. Beautiful. We're going to use that to make a tincture first, and then we're going to make a salve. And then a little bit later, once the salve's a little bit more ready, we'll also add a tea on at the end. So let's make that tincture. Tinctures are pretty easy. Just take the root there and just stuff it into the jar. You see the beautiful, lovely roots in the jar there. I want to get the jar pretty full to where it's not so tight that you can't like squeeze it down a little bit more to where it's just kind of a nice soft tightness a full jar though and then go ahead and add an 80 proof vodka this doesn't need an Everclear because some of the constituents specifically come out well with water so you want to have your <coughs> alcohol source have a bit of water in it. That basically is how you make a tincture. You want to shake that every so often. Keep that, I'd say, for a couple months in the jar and then strain it out. You'll have a, a lovely tincture. We'll check it again tomorrow, see how much more yellow it's gotten. But it should be just a, a delightful tincture there. This is a day later. You can see it's already getting quite yellow. That color will continue to pull out of the roots. And it's uh, quite lovely. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make an herbal infused oil that will then be made into a salve. So I've got the crock pot here, a mini crock pot on low. And I'm going to add some of this organ grape root in there. Oops, not that. Um, but because I want this to be a healing salve with more multi-spectrum defenses, I'm going to add some of this yarrow, which should make it really great for kind of drying up the badness. This is specifically a salve that's going to be really good for like an infected, red, pussy, angry wound. We're going to want to use some of the styptic powers of the yarrow in there. Um, I'm going to use some of this plantain leaf. Plantain's a really good one for more of the soothing and healing effect, as is the calendula over here. Also, all these are somewhat antimicrobial as well. also going to add a little bit of the organ grape leaf into that. They found that the organ grape leaf added to the organ grape root actually enhances its bioavailability a little bit more. This is a real cool thing. It's an herb scissors. It just shreds your herbs into several little lovely strips. Look at this interesting object here. And the leaves will also make a especially lovely green color. Everybody likes a nice green colored salve, don't they? <laughs> I know I do. There we go. Kind of toss that around a little bit. Let's see what we got in there. Quite a witch's cauldron of interesting medicinal herbs. Add some extra virgin olive oil to try to, as much as you can, to cover that up. We. <laughs> Ooh. 
Oh, let's get serious here. There we go. Get all that goodness submerged in there. I'm going to let this go in the low setting for a few hours until I see it's kind of starting to bubble up and then I'm going to put that down on warm and leave it overnight and just let all these herbs, these wonderful herbs, infuse in there into that oil and that will be the basis for our wound healing salve. Here's some of those beautiful leaves again of the organ grape. Quite pokey. Ouch! Okay, this pot is boiling, which means it's time to make our urinary tract infection tea that I want to make today using the organ grape. Let's just take a nice First off, you want to start with a big pot of tea, because if you're making a urinary tract infection tea, you don't want just a little cup of tea. That's not going to do it. It's not going to fix you. What you want is a big cauldron, at least, because you're going to be drinking a lot of this tea throughout the day, probably for several days. Probably going to have to make another big pot of tea. But in any case, let's take a good, good little handful of this stuff, throw it in there. This is going to be a terrible tasting tea, by the way. And it's going to be very concentrated, but we're going to put some of that organ grape root and stem bark in there. I'm going to actually throw in some uva ursi, which is another really great urinary tract infection herb. It's uh, often found in landscaping. Look around. Sometimes you'll see it in local parks. They're trying to give a wild look. It also grows up in the woods pretty well. Now let's put some uva ursi in there. This is not going to do the flavor any good. This is going to be a very bitter tea, a very kind of nasty tea. So I'm going to throw a cinnamon stick in there. And cinnamon sticks also have some benefits for urinary tract infections. So that's a good one to throw in. As is our next one, the horsetail. I'm going to throw in some horsetail. It's got that great silica content. It kind of just cleans out your bladder. Little scrub brushes. Oh, and you also want to put in some organ grape leaf. Find they've we found that having the organ grape leaf actually improves some of the uptake for the organ grape root and the berberine itself. Slightly different compounds in the leaf. So let's go ahead and put some of that organ grape leaf in there using this wonderful tool again, the herb shredder scissors. Makes it real quick. And there we go. That's a tea with cinnamon, organ grape root, um, organ grape leaf, organ grape stem, <laughs> and some of this horsetail. Let's uh, go ahead and stir that up a little bit. Now I'm going to want to put that on a low heat once I've got it boiling. I'm going to put that on a low heat and just simmer that at low for at least a half an hour after it's reached boiling temperatures. Oh, also, since this is going to be a very unpalatable tea, it's going to be a pretty nasty tasting tea, we're going to grape is very bitter. Why don't you take and add a tea bag of something you do like in there and a bunch of stevia. You don't really want to be adding a lot of sugar to a urinary tract infection tea because the sugar will feed the bacteria that are messing with your bladder. But something like a stevia or a monk fruit, you could throw a little bit of honey in there, but that's still quite a bit of sugar. 
that might feed the bacteria. Uh, there it is, quite the cauldron. Ooh, I like the good stuff. All floating around in there. So yeah, put that on a low simmer and let that just roll for a good half an hour at least to get that nice and extracted from those uh, more difficult roots. The roots, they just take longer than say a nice tender leaf might to get the constituents out. A little tincture of time. Okay, now let's do this tea. Here it is, the urinary tract infection tea. Um, I've got this lovely funnel that's got a sieve in it. That's real great. Get all the chunks out. Let's take a look at what we got here. Look at that tea. It's a beautiful amber color. I bet if we had more light in here, you'd really see more reds. Let's give that a taste. Ooh, that's bitter, but also quite cinnamony. It's uh, not a tea you're going to want to like just sip for fun, but you're going to want to start out with um, small amounts kind of very frequently throughout the day. Um, like I said, you're not going to want to just drink a whole mug of this. This might be enough for, for a whole day, um, or at least part of a day. But start with small amounts, bring it up, but continue to use it for several days, up to maybe a week. And not, not continuously, though. This is not something you want to take like every day for the rest of your life. Just uh, this is kind of an, for an acute urinary tract infection. When you feel it coming on, see if you can get it to go away with this lovely tea. Hey guys, and we are back. It's been overnight. Let that go down to warm overnight, then back onto low to get it back up to temperature. You want it to be at least 150 degrees. Uh, more than that to get the beeswax pellets, because that's the boiling point of the, or the melting point of the beeswax pellets. It's 150 degrees, so you need to get your oil back up to temperature. Um, and also, I'd get it a couple more hours today just to extract a little bit more rapidly. Let's see what it's looking like in there. Looks like good oil. Let's go ahead and strain that out now. Got a funnel with a strainer on it. Works pretty good for these purposes. Well, it's pretty hot. I got a bit more than two cups here. Let me get the rest of that out. Basically, I'm going to go ahead and clean up this 
crock pot and put the oil back in there and we're going to melt the beeswax right there in the crock pot. You can do a big fancy double broiler if you want to, but this just seems a lot easier to me. Since we were there anyhow. Get all the chunks out. Don't need so many chunks in our salve. Get that back in there. So the general recipe for salve, I mean how much oil you'll make depends on how much root you make. <clears throat> but it's basically a cup of infused oil and then add to that one ounce or approximately two tablespoons of these beeswax pellets and then add just a little a little teaspoon quarter teaspoon of vitamin E oil just to give it a little extra shelf stability you need to get your oil up to 150 degrees I'm pretty sure we're way above that it was pretty hot earlier let's give it a check Oh yeah, we're way above 150. Looks like we're somewhere around 215 maybe. That should be plenty, plenty warm enough to get those beeswax pellets in here. So. We've got a couple cups in there. Go ahead, and since it's a little over a couple cups, I'm going to do a heaping teaspoon, tablespoon full. One cup infused oil, two tablespoons of the beeswax. Approximately, it can be more or less beeswax, depending on your preference. I need another spoon. Just watch those beeswax pellets in there. They're melting away. It's happening pretty quick. Okay, I'd say that's pretty good. Let's go ahead and add the vitamin E oil. See what the consistency is. Very hot. Yeah, you can already see getting a, a salve consistency there. I think it's good. Go ahead and turn that off, and we can start to fill. 
What's great is to get some little jars. You can get a variety of different shapes of little jars, but for a wound setup, you probably want them to be pretty small. You're not going to want to make a big jug of this stuff. Because then... Then you might go bad before you actually finish it. Um, herbal oils can eventually go bad once they've been opened and you put your greasy little fingers in there. But they last quite a bit longer. Closed up. Just go ahead and pour that into the jars. Well, you get the picture. Let those cool off and we'll see what it looks like. Okay guys, it's been a long journey following me from digging out my roots in the woods to coming back to the kitchen, making teas and tinctures and now this salve. And here it is. The end result is the beautiful wound healing salve. Look at that. What a wonderful consistency. Put that on any kind of uh, nasty little cuts and scrapes and abrasions you get. Fall down, scrape your knee. This is a good one. This is for something that's a little bit angry. A red, pissed off, slightly infected wound. Try this. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. And you will heal. And you will heal well. So now that I've shown you how to make some wonderful medicine, I want to remind you that it's very important to go see a doctor or a naturopath or at least an herbalist before starting any herbals for your conditions. For one thing, you may not really understand what your diagnosis is. You may think it's just a little bit of this and that that can be treated with some plants when it's really something serious and you're missing it and it could, could be fatal. Um, also, there are interactions between herbs and drugs, and there's also contraindications between some of the problems you may be having and the herbs you may think you need. <laughs> so don't start taking anything willy-nilly unless you're sure what's going on. And to be sure, come see a naturopath like me. I'm in Portland, Oregon. I do house calls in the greater Portland area, and I also have an office in Milwaukee.